me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So Aman and I will be doing this together. Just a little bit of background of the group that we're part of. We're part of um, IBM Telecom and Media Labs, uh, which is part of IBM's Global Solution Center. The charter of our group is to basically develop emerging solutions and identify what the next big opportunity is within the industry. And uh, so we do a lot of work with AI, analytics, blockchain, and our recent focus has been around network virtualization and 5G networks. So we will show you how blockchain is being used in all these different areas. And uh, I'll just quickly start off. I think uh, uh, just just a couple of things. You know, even though we're focused on, um, let me just go into presentation mode here. Even though we're focused here on uh, the, the work that we're doing uh, within telco and media, I just want to remind and stress that IBM does a lot of work with blockchain in lots of different industries. And what we're going to show today is show you some of the solutions that we have. So you get a, uh, an idea of some of the work that we're doing. We'll talk about some of the customers that we're working with. And uh, it'll be a mixture of videos and live demos. Just because of the lack of time, we won't be able to show some of these live, but uh, hopefully it'll give you an idea of, of, of some of the work that we're currently doing in the blockchain. So I'll start off with the first uh, solution, which is really around roaming and fraud. This is, um, has uh, got a lot of tractions across a lot of, of, of the communication service providers. And there are also clearing houses such as Cineverse where uh, we're, we're working with right now. And the basic idea is when you go from one location to the other, generally it takes a lot of time to reconcile the bills, determine how long a call happened and who should be charged for, and often a lot of these costs are written off. And with blockchain, you have a consistent, coherent, unified view of what's happening, when a specific call started, when it ended. And uh, what I'll do is just quickly show a video of, of this uh, a solution that we've created. And this has been done with, uh, and, I, and at the end, we'll talk about some of the actual customers that we've, done, we've worked with and uh, some of the references that you can, you know, Google search and get more details on. But the I, I, clear idea behind um, the, the, the roaming solution is when, whenever you make a call, what you see here is a set of people located uh, globally and uh, a set of different parties that are interested. It could be the communication service provider, the person who actually owns the uh, cell phone and uh, so on and so forth. And this, these are the actual calls that are being made. And so we can go ahead and uh, simulate an actual call being made. And so when, when that actual call, call is made to, to a separate location, what will happen is a specific transaction will be go, go ahead and will be created within, 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 within blockchain. And each of the parties involved can now look and see exactly what happened. So the, the, in our specific case, they have, uh, we, have, we have two uh, communication service providers, ABC and XYZ, and they're able to in real time see the calls as they're actually being made. And are these, call, are these individuals in a, in a roaming location? So in this specific case, uh, what, when the roaming call is made, the roaming entry is, is made into the, uh, into the ledger. And uh, the net benefit of, of this is, and you know, the, the, the actual solution takes quite a bit of time if we go into all the details. But, but uh, as in the actual transactions, what happens is when you go to a remote location, first you have to get registered, right? And all those transactions, the registering, the calling, the call ending, are, are all captured in, in blockchain. And what generally happens right now is there'll be a clearinghouse that all this information goes to and that clearinghouse then does all the reconciliation and make sure everybody else get, gets, gets the right bill. And we're not uh, disintermediating or removing the clearinghouse. The clearinghouses can clearly still stay there, but they're now able to get their information much quicker and much more accurately than they used to. 
But the benefit of doing that, and so, you know, we can go into multiple views and we can go into details on, because the different types of calls, different types of charges that can be made. Um, how do we, do you reconcile all of these? You may have a billing agreement uh, with your carrier here, but when you go overseas, your billing agreement must be, is probably different. So there's a whole set of things that, that, that need to be reconciled that we also show. The other benefit that this also does is, it, uh, the next piece that we also show is when we actually, we can actually go ahead and make a call and as part of the call right now, especially when you're overseas, it's very difficult to know if you're over your, your calling plan. And so what we are able to do with blockchain is as soon as you're close to your overage plan, okay, the, the, the customer can be notified. Again, because the transactions are stored in blockchain, all the information is retrieved. Uh, it, it close to real time. And uh, be, even before you make the call, you can be warned and notified when you're overseas, even though you're on a completely different communication service providers network that you are potentially going to run into an overage. This is not possible uh, using, uh, unless the, the CSP is in the process of implementing some of these solutions. And then the added benefit that uh, this also has is all, all around fraud. So the idea would be I could take someone's SIMS card and steal it and go to another a different location but now that you have blockchain managing all these transactions, if you've already identified that SIM card as being fraudulent or you're able to identify that someone made a call from this location and in 30 seconds they're making a call from the other part of the, from the end of the world, we clearly have, it, have an issue here. So we're able to go ahead and ensure the uh, registration does not happen. And again, all of these transactions are managed, monitored uh, by blockchain. And we have all these different uh, CSP providers that are working together. And then what we can do is actually go into the blockchain and show the different transactions when they were created um, and uh, how long did it take you know, and uh, other uh, activities related to that. So that, that's one, one of the um, solutions that we, we, we're getting a lot of traction from a blockchain perspective. I'll pass it on to Aman, who will talk about a couple more. Yeah. About all yours? Yeah, let me start sharing my screen. Um, so before, meanwhile, I'm transitioning. Let me also uh, mention. Uh, I think Matthew's we uh, missed discussing this when we were planning that uh, for this session. Uh, I see David on call, and I don't know if Bipin is on or not. But um, as part of this use case, uh, uh, roaming and settlement management, I think we also worked with the telecom uh, special interest group to. Um, uh, write a white paper on the settlement process that how blockchain is used for settlements between service providers which is a kind of a extension of this solution uh, hey Amon, this is raj here uh, we are recording the session so if you don't mind can you make it a uh, play, play uh, the presentation yeah yeah i was about to do that i just start sharing so um so the next use case that i'm um, we're going to discuss on is the uh, application of um blockchain or specifically hyperledger uh, that uh, we are using in this case for the supply chain management of ad sales in the in the media industry so this was a poc that we uh, worked on about uh, 3 years ago the poc that we worked on was more on linear ad sales but then it was also implemented for digital ad sales for a big uh, ad services uh, provider uh, media ocean you can look it up it's a public announcement so um, Basically, uh, I'm not going to go through all the points there, but uh, we, we talk about that how uh, blockchain application is being used to streamline the process of ad uh, services between the uh, advertisers and ad agencies and the uh, uh, broadcasters, how to properly track, track the uh, outcome of those of ads and how to properly map it with different broadcasters. So if I, again, um, I'm going to show a quick uh, video of, uh, the demo that we created at that time so uh, um, and again this is more of a poc that was created so we show different views uh, for different uh, for ad, ad, ad sales uh, for the uh, content creation uh, creators and the broadcaster so let's say it's the, uh, this broadcaster called big blue television that broadcaster is releasing uh, certain uh, ad slots so again uh, as soon as that event occurs blockchain tracks that what ad source were released 
uh, and how that ad slots are then being mapped to different ad agencies. So as soon as those ad slots are, are released, then different ad agencies can now start mapping their advertisements to those advertising slots. So in this case, I'm just, we go through the process and those uh, different advertisements are being mapped to those slots. And again, uh, as we move forward, uh, those map ads are then now broadcasted by the broadcaster. So let's say that after the broadcast has been done, then there are certain uh, outcome of that that's supposed to be uh, shared back with the content creators and the advertising agencies by the broadcasters. This was one of the key pain points where uh, this solution uh, worked on that currently a lot of um, um, uh, uh, things are hidden in this process that what was the outcome of particular uh, advertisement. Uh, and then uh, a lot of numbers are lost there because of the inconsistency between the data bases being managed by different agencies. So with this, uh, uh, we show that how we can streamline that process and make it true transparent across different uh, 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 participants. So as uh, we go through forward in the process, after the ad, uh, um, uh, the advertisement result is released back to the agencies. They can easily track down that which ad generated what kind of TRP uh, or, or GRP and all that. And in this case, we can see that which actually meant uh, met the expected outcome, which advertisement slots didn't meet the expe expected outcomes. And is there some kind of reconciliation process in that? For example, let's say the smart contract rule says that if a particular uh, target was not met, maybe there should be a, a process to um, um, uh, compensate for that by assigning uh, additional ad slots for that or, or maybe uh, sharing uh, or, or refunding some, uh, some part of the revenue or something. So this is the linear advertisement sales that uh, we worked on. And again, there's a digital work a version of this that is also being implemented for digital ad sales uh, in, the, in the social media. Uh, part of the world. Uh, let me go to the next use case. Okay. And the next use case that we want to present on is the application of um, uh, Hyperledger and block, Hyperledger blockchain in managing the supply chain in uh, telco industry. So we called it enterprise supply chain because at, at that time it was more focused on the um, um, uh, supply chain of, of um, Network, network equipment and network services for enterprises. So basically it was uh, mainly uh, around the role of a CSP that how a service provider when providing a particular service to an enterprise needs to work with a lot of different participants and vendors in order to fulfill or complete a network service. For example, in this case, a CSP uh, gets a request to provision or uh, create a new VOIP service for an enterprise customer. So they have to work with uh, the device suppliers to uh, provide physical devices or IoT devices. Then they also have to work with the VNF or the software providers in, in the new world of SDN. There are certain network services that require VNFs and CNFs. So they need to work with those software providers. And then they also need to work with um, you know, installation agents and other uh, access network agents in this case to complete that network services for an enterprise customer. So how do you use blockchain to manage all these different moving parts? How are we monitoring different components and their life cycle in this supply chain? And how we are keeping track also of, of the devices that are involved in this case. So again, um, uh, going to the live, uh, not the live, but uh, a recorded uh, demonstration of this. Um, uh, not this. Okay. So basically, uh, we start and let me also make this screen bigger. And if I'm going fast, or if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask and um, stop me or ask me to pause. So basically, uh, we go through three uh, different phases in this particular demonstration. We show the supply chain part, we show the service provisioning part and the security aspect of the service once it's provisioned, and then how we are managing the life cycle events of that service for each and every component inside it. So let's say that we start with the order uh, uh, ordering process here that uh, a, a service provider has a catalog of services being exposed 
in that then a particular service is picked up and then you request for the service the enterprise is particularly requested for the service in this case it's the iot smart location system that is being requested to be provisioned then we as we move forward basically that request goes to an order management system in this case we are using an ibm order management system called sterling but uh, as this order is being processed as that quote is received that order is being processed to create smaller service orders and then those service orders are then so sent to different uh, um um participants all this is in the back is being tracked by blockchain so that order is captured a transaction for that is written on blockchain the service orders are being processed it's also captured in blockchain so when we go to this view which again we created for demonstration purpose uh that how different participants will view that information or consume that information in their own dashboards so let's say the enterprise customer will be able to see the new um service that they requested and the status of that so uh, they will be able to see that what service they are getting what components will be provisioned for that service the csp will also be able to see the new order that was received from an enterprise and the details of that so in this you can see there's a virtual component there's a physical component there's a logical component that's just our way to show that how there are multiple or it's a hybrid service so there there's a software and also a physical device involved in that and how we are managing this complex environment and the transactions on that so let's say the first step is to for to request for an equipment provider to uh, provide an equipment for this particular enterprise service so in this case we show that how uh, a service provider may be working with uh, thousands of of uh, different equipment providers across the globe uh, but in this case the smart contract behind hyperledger is able to process that order is able to uh, is a smart contract is able to uh, identify the right equipment provider based on the uh, uh, agreements with those the sla agreements the requirements with different equipment providers to so the um, uh, right equipment providers based on that particular enterprise order is automatically identified and then that equipment provider will receive an order to supply that physical equipment and again this is also uh, all this information that you see is coming from the blockchain layer so uh um, it's not complete but we are showing the abstracted information for this demonstration purpose so that equipment provider receives the uh information that is needed to uh, provide that equipment and when that equipment is provided we will see that the physical equipment shipment update is made on blockchain and the view will be updated on different uh dashboards another thing that we highlight here is that how we are using hyperledger smart contract to manage the implement the sla agreements in this working for example let's say uh, in this case the equipment provider was supposed to ship the equipment in a particular sla time so if that is not met the uh, sla uh, the, the smart contract might have a agreement rule to be processed that you might pay a, a smaller bill if the shipment is not done in time or if the shipment is done in time there might be a different amount to be paid something like that so we show that how we can easily enforce these sla rules in uh, these relationships in a supply chain environment so moving forward uh, once the equipment is provisioned uh, then we uh, just request an um, sorry once the equipment is shipped then we request an agent to install that equipment at the enterprise location same thing that uh, how smart contract will be able to uh, identify the right field agent in agency based on the location details of the enterprise and the requirements of the enterprise so smart contract will be able to identify the right field agent that field agent will receive the request and that field agent will go in to uh, uh, provision that equipment this is actually a uh, uh, a live view of our of our raspberry pi when we show the demo live we actually use a raspberry pi to show uh, uh, or to mimic that physical device that is supposed to be provisioned so in this case when we actually click on the install and activation it actually sends a request to a iot platform that we are using in our solution and the iot platform activates our raspberry pi that basically mimics that there is a enterprise equipment getting activated another important thing that we highlight here from a iot security and supply chain point of view that every time certain component of the service is getting provisioned we are also managing the state of that component for example in this case you see that there is a device hash added next to the physical component so what we are doing is 
against the entity on blockchain that's uh, um, basically the asset on blockchain that's that's corresponding to this physical equipment out of the service we store a hash key against it that maps to the existing configuration of that device so let's say uh, and, and it, it come in the later part of the of this video that if someone goes in and tampers with the equipment that how we can easily track that with blockchain and, and flag this device that it is not authorized this is also very applicable in in today's uh, uh, world example for example let's say there are there are certain devices that you smart home devices that you have at your home that you are not supposed to uh, change or tamper with because it 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 it's critical to your data and your home security. So how do you manage blo uh, use blockchain to manage that tampering and manage the configuration changes to your device? So that's another thing that we highlight in our um, use case. So let's move forward. I'm going to quickly go through uh, past a few steps. We also show that how now we are provisioning the, uh, uh, the VNF that is going to activate the network uh, function on cloud. So we also show that how we are managing licenses for those VNFs. They are, there could be an inventory of licenses that service provider has between CSP and the VNF provider, how we are using blockchain to properly track the assignment of those licenses on these VNF provisions. So once this is provisioned, we actually show that how we track the, com uh, we completely track the entire supply chain process of provisioning of this network service. In the end, we also show a usage of this that when we, now when I click on this button, which is like a doorbell, uh, it actually triggers, I, the a video a voice call to my laptop basically we show that how it goes through an authentication process it shows that there was a presence detected on the device in the location which triggered that voice call to me and all this is live actual services getting provisioned it's just that we're using blockchain to track all these and then when i move forward we also show a, a, a tampering use case for example in this case when i insert a usb device basically that this uh, it, configuration change in the raspberry pi is not authorized so we show that now again when we try to activate the network service it actually doesn't let the voice call to go because the authentication was failed so in this case we show that how at in on blockchain we are able to capture that event that there was a configuration change detected and it immediately noted change the device status to not authorized and it didn't allow the device to use the voip service so this is um, the part where we highlight the security aspect of the IoT devices and how we are managing that in our use case. And again, with it being tracked on blockchain, this can trigger other alerts or it can easily uh, release this, uh, this. This information will also be available to be viewed by other participants based on their access or based on how you have configured your smart contract. Uh, Another sim similar thing, we also show the, sec the security and integrity violation on the software side as well. So what, what I do is now I am, I'm actually logging into the container that's running our BOIP service. So again, our the VNF uh, or the CNF that we provision is a containerized VOIP service running on cloud. So I actually log into one of the containers running our VOIP server and I run a process that I, that is not allowed by the policy. So we show that how we are also uh, managing uh, or tracking the integrity violations uh, on the software side as well. So in this case, it's the VOIP server that had some integrity violation and it's immediately tracked by blockchain and notified to the required participants. So that was our use case that we sh where we show application of Hyperledger on the enterprise supply chain of a network service for service providers. Recently, we, we, we did an extension of this use case uh, while working with a service provider in North America. So basically what we did was we realized that we already have uh, this system in place. Now, how can we extend this use case to now also manage the data that is being generated with network services like this or with IoT devices uh, like this, similar to what we saw in the in the in the last uh, use case. So here, we, then we created a, a platform or created an extension of this platform that now is also able to manage the data uh, being created by uh, the smart home devices or services. And we can also manage the user consent. Basically, we are giving a user 
the ability to provide consent on sharing that data with third party. So this was uh, a very um, another a very important use case that getting a lot of tra uh, uh, traction with our um, clients. So I quickly go to that part. So. Um, yeah. Okay, so now basically, uh, again, um, we start with the supply chain part, we actually are able to show that how we are uh, provisioning um, the IoT devices and the and, um, network services that are going in a, in a smart home. So in this case, it's more of a consumer based use case, but uh, can easily be applied on enterprises as well. So let's say, uh, with the process that we show in the last that we saw in the last video, we have provisioned a set of a smart home service which has IoT devices running in the smart home and also has uh, certain network services running in the smart home. So now, when the user logs in, the user is able to see the different gateways that are currently assigned or uh, uh, is currently in the ownership of that user. So I can see these different gateways that are that are here that I have in my office, in my smart home, or in other locations, right? And I can also see the sensors that are currently, uh, or the sources that are generating data in that smart hub or in that gateway. So let's say that I just provisioned a new smart home and I'm, I want to add certain sensors or certain devices in that. So again, we are using uh, a Raspberry Pi in this case that acts like IoT device and a gateway. And then, uh, we are we are using certain sensors to create data in our live demonstration. In this case, we are actually using a TI sensor that creates live data like humidity, lux, uh, luminosity, temperature, etc. And then we have also added a camera that can create a video feed. So as we make these changes, we also show that how all all this is getting tracked by our hyperledger layer. So for example, in this case, when I click on adding a sensor, so I'm actually gonna add a camera to my existing gateway. As that gets processed, we, we see a block getting written to our Hyperledger layer, which basically updates. So it, it, it's not just uh, one transaction. We saw one block here, but in, in the process in the back end is actually executing multiple transactions on, on two or three different chain codes that we have in our ecosystem. In this case, for example, it will add that but it will create a new identity on blockchain for that camera it will add save the configuration of the device it will update the configuration of our gateway and record the new hash key on on blockchain and it will also notify optionally notify an event to the service provider and other participants in the ecosystem that this change has been made in a smart home of that particular customer so now basically uh, we have the updated uh, view on blockchain uh, that can monitor this service, this smart home service. So in this case, we now we can also manage uh, another thing that I added in this use case that now user is able to provide consent whether or not this data that is being generated out of the smart home devices should be shared outside with third parties. For example, initially, let's say the video uh, data was not being shared outside. So as the user enables the consent, to share the video data outside, you will be able to see that uh, that transaction was recorded on blockchain as well. And then the video stream will be enabled to be viewed outside. So we actually go to a portal where we show that we can see that video stream going outside. And then when we remove the consent again and we save it and another transaction returns, that video feed will go away. So we, we just show that how we are able to uh, give user the power to manage consent on this data sharing with third parties, which currently I think is a very important uh, uh, thing which various uh, service providers are working on. Uh, sim we show similar thing with our other uh, sensors as well. For example, in this case, I'm enabling uh, temperature and luxometer data to be shared outside. And once I do that, uh, we, see, we go to the CSP site where we have our IoT platform hosted and we can see that that data feed is now available to the service provider to be shared with third parties. We, we show the third party view of this use case as well, that how now that a service provider has this uh, capability to manage user consent on certain data, how the service provider now can 
give access or manage access for third parties to get to get this user data from the service provider and this is also a good monetizing uh, cap uh, opportunity for the service providers as well because currently they have very limited or no control over third parties accessing their uh, user data so we also show that how uh, we are also adding third parties in this blockchain ecosystem or this use case and they can leverage that to get access to user data so we go to this ui again this is a more of a demonstration ui not an official product so a third party can request uh, i'm selecting the third party who's requesting temperature and luxometer data service provider will receive that request will approve it and again all these approvals and requests are getting recorded on hyperledger and as the request is approved third party is now able to receive the data the, this ui is not that fancy but it, it shows the functionality of um, approval uh, and requests for third parties uh, for to access the third, uh, user data with that I'll, before i go to the next uh, use case i'll pause for any questions on this part Okay. If no questions, then let me go to the. There were a couple of questions in chat. I don't know if okay. you saw those. Now, um, uh, Aman, we we will we have. I am kind of capturing all the questions. Okay, so great. Okay. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll we'll get the, we'll get. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So we can. Uh, but I think it's it, uh, both for you and for uh, Thomas. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there, a lot of people have. Well, it's at this point. Let's put it this way. No questions, but very impressive. So, we have to be prepared for the questions. Okay, so let me let me finish off with our last use case, and so that we leave enough time for questions. Um, and I'll I'll try to be quick with this one as well. So, now uh, one of the latest use cases that we have been working with. So, as Matthews mentioned, that we have been focusing a lot of on on five G and network cloudification. So, one of the latest use cases that we have been working on is around network slicing in 5g so we already saw in in the last two use cases that how we are managing uh, or we are show, showcasing the hyperledger application to manage the supply chain for a network service in this case we show a specific example of a 5g network slice so what we actually have uh, we created in a lab recently as part of uh, a poc that how uh, we can provision a 5g network slice on the fly by um, a, a bss process all the starting from all, all the way from a service catalog like we saw in the last video and then how that service catalog is exposing a network slice service and then the network slice order is received and the order management sends that to our mano which is our, our cloud our telco network cloud orchestrator to provision that network serve network uh, 5G network slice across different um, components. So in this case, we actually have uh, created a network edge, a network cloud, and then we show that how we deploy a 5G core with a slice on our network cloud, and then how we are um, uh, also creating resources, dedicated resources on our IMS and our VRAN part to create a network slice and our, oh, sorry, on our Jun um, Juniper transport layer as well. But as we are making all these changes in the network, as we are processing the requests for these new network slices, how we are using Hyperledger to track uh, all this. So this one actually is something that I can show live. And again, um, I'll, I won't go more deep dive into the 5G side of the network slice part, since that's not the focus, I'll try to cover the blockchain part of it. So let's say, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going through, through our uh, auto capture UI. So this is, Let's say I'm, I'm logging in as a customer here, and then the customer can see a set of services being offered by the service provider. And here, I'm for this particular example, I'm gonna go to 5G services. I'm gonna select the data center where I want to deploy this, and I'm, I can select either gold or silver network slice. Again, it's more of a, uh, more to show how you can uh, create uh, services with different KPIs or performance uh, commitments. So in this case, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm going to my gold network slice. And as soon as I'm submitting, submitting the code, 
again, what it's doing in the back end is that it's first creating a code on our um, uh, configure price and code product. Then it sends that off to our order management product and that order management system creates a set of services to be provisioned as part of this network slice. So, and as all these systems were uh, creating these events, were talking to each other, each system was logging up a transaction onto our blockchain. So when I go to my blockchain UI, which is again our UI that we uh, use to demonstrate these use cases, I can see the new order for the gold uh, network slice. When I uh, go to the enterprise customer, the enterprise customer is also able to see the new request that they made for the gold network slice. So now when I go into details, I, sh I should be able to see the different components. Similarly, like we saw in the last videos, that needs to be provisioned. In this case, the physical component is already there, which is basically the cloud infrastructure in, on the network edge and the uh, uh, network cloud. So, and so we, the only thing needs to be provisioned is the virtual component, which is actually the CNF for the 5G slice that needs to be provisioned. So same thing that I need a license to, to provision the service. So when I click on assign, you will see a new transaction being executed. So as soon as that transaction is added, I can see the status that the license should be assigned. So what happened in the back end? smart contract was able to check on the inventory that the CSP has with the VNF provider. So in this case, uh, there are already licenses available for that five to create a 5G network slice. So when we requested for the service to be process the blockchain smart contract identified a license from the inventory and assigned it for this particular network slice service so when i see the details i can now see that a particular uh, monthly license has been assigned for this 5g network slice and the green arrow just basically shows uh, another um another capability that we've added is basically we are using a data store to uh, manage all these licenses and blockchain uh, creates a check on that data store so whenever we see uh, an information like this it's just make sure that that uh, information is right and it's coming legitly from the data store now the only next step is to provision this and again it's all api driven so when i click on provision it actually processes this order further on, on Hyperledger. It, it creates a transaction on Hyperledger and it sends a request or API call to our orchestration tool to create that network slice. So when I click provision, it's actually going to process that and we're going to see a new uh, transaction being written onto our blockchain layer. And with that, when I go, go to our orchestration tool, uh, let me refresh this. Okay, my session is out. This is our, our own, uh, IBM's own uh, telco network cloud orchestrator, which we use to provision these network services. So when I quickly log into this, we'll see that the request was sent here to create that gold network slice. Uh, I won't go detail into detail of this. This is more on the network technical details of the network provision, network cloudification side. But I, what I wanted to highlight is that how uh, we are able to integ uh, integrate with all these other orchestration tools and, and, and products uh, in order to manage the events that are generated out of use cases like this. For example, as soon as these, this creation will be completed, we'll be able to see that this service will be marked complete and that update will be sent to CSP and the enterprise that your network slice is now up and running. It takes about two minutes, so I won't wait for it to complete, but um, this is what I wanted to show you live on the network slice use case. So with that, uh, Matthews, I'll give it back to you to summarize uh, some of these uh, engagements that we've been participating in. Sure, let me start sharing, Aman, because I have to do, can you just stop sharing? Yeah. And then I'll, because I'll, I have to show another chart after this. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So let me just, uh, so we have a reference architecture. I'm just looking at time, I'm just, you know, the, the multiple reference architecture, obviously, all of these will vary depending on specific opportunities. We have multiple customer references. Uh, the first one that uh, we showed was around roaming and uh, the reconciliation. So, you know, if you just Google search for IBM Cineverse, you can see, uh, get a lot of information about what we've done there with them. 
uh, work with multiple telco providers and the clearinghouse, in this case being Cineverse. The work that we've done around ads, uh, work with uh, work with MediaOcean around ad reconciliation and media reconciliation and uh, determining who actually viewed those ads. So, so th th that's another reference that we had. Another one that we've done is with the uh, Regulatory Authority of India. And, and this is basically ensuring that telemarketers have the uh, right to actually uh, send messages to uh, different uh, consumers and uh, do they have the consent so basically hopefully you've seen um, you know these are actual references of actual implementations and uh, you know for those interested later on we can get into more details but hopefully the solutions that we showed you gave you an idea of what we're doing I just want to address uh, 5g also um, so we're doing a lot of work with 5g right now we see two primarily de uh, demands for 5g with blockchain and telcos. The first is around the creation of the infrastructure. So 5G requires about five or six times the number of, um, you know, of, of cell nodes, et cetera, to actually receive the signal. So the infrastructure is a lot more complicated and, and much more extensive, which means a lot more parties are involved. So setting up one of the, the infrastructure requires a lot of different parties. So blockchain is being used quite a lot in there and we've worked in that area. The second area is just around what Aman just showed, which is uh, the actual core network. So for those of you who may not be familiar with what a slice is just to repeat what Aman just said. Think of a slice as a specific of area of the uh, some proportion of the network dedicated to a set of individuals. So, for example, if you go to a stadium right now, okay, all of you are going to get the same experience pretty much with your provider. But what slicing does is it now enables the uh, CSP to segment and say a certain set of ex customers get a better experience based on a whole set of factors, and all of this will be running on the edge. So that introduces a whole set of additional participants and a whole set of new pricing schemes, et cetera. So I, I'm going to have to deploy new containers to the edge to manage all of this. I got to make sure the slices are created for, 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 for these specific as, as, uh, services. And uh, all of that comes with the charging model. So all of these transactions and everything has to be monitored and managed. So we believe that blockchain it has a big role to play. So that's just a very high level overview of some of the work that we're doing. I also have one more thing that I need to quickly cover, and that is the telecom uh, blockchain special interest group that we have. So there are special group interest groups within, um, you know, Hi Hyperledger that cover different industries and different areas. But for those of you who are, who are in um, Telecom, I just want to give you some information and if you're not involved or if you're in another industry, let us know. David can pr provide you more details about some of the industries. These are some of the activities that we do, uh, define use cases, architecture, and we have different subgroups as, uh, associated with it. One of the pieces that we did was based on, uh, Aman briefly mentioned it, um, you know, we, we have a white paper out there. It, some of it was based on the work that we showed around roaming, but this is of course multiple uh, vendors and CSPs that were involved in this and the work that they did. So if you're interested in, in, in doing some of this, you know, and if you just do a Google search, you'll find some of this information out there and some of our uh, activities that we published. So if you're interested in doing some of this, I'd highly recommend, please go to this website or contact David, myself, and uh, specifically from a telecom perspective or anybody else who's interested in um, Hyperledger and they'll be able to direct you to the right place. With that, I know we went through really quickly, but hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the use cases that we're working on within IBM. Within I'll open it up for questions. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Oman and uh, <clears throat> Thomas. Uh, uh, it's an awesome presentation. Um, again, uh, we are honored uh, that you know, IBM is doing a lot of this work and uh, you guys, uh, uh, part of IBM, <clears throat> IBM Dallas have uh, been able to help us uh, with this. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, and personally to me, it's very interesting because I have my background with telecom. I've done telecom for 25 years uh, from Trojer, crossbar, uh, telephone switches, all the way to an 
optical or, or optical network device at home. So that's that's my background before I got into block, blockchain and uh, healthcare. So uh, again, uh, very appreciative of what what you have provided. Uh, I just want to kind of you know, touch base with a few questions that uh, <clears throat> uh, came out from the chat, um, and and then uh, I'll open it up for people to ask this question. Uh, uh, on the on the chat, mainly basically they were trying to see is uh, uh, yes, this is an excellent use case uh, as all of us know. Um, and blockchain come, I mean, with the cryptocurrency, not, not to use the same connotation, it's different, uh, but uh, the, the challenge is with the cost. Uh, how, how do you make sure that the cost is, uh, <clears throat> uh, who bears the cost and how, how do you manage that? Uh, and then when it comes to cost, again, um, the two things that you, one of the things that you really guys cover, both of you covered was uh, in terms of, <clears throat> Uh, the legal settlement and uh, and the process where uh, of um, meeting certain criteria, uh, but in terms of governance, so if you can share a little information on the cost structure uh, in terms of a sustainable model and the governance, uh, that that would be good. And then I have a couple of other questions before I open up to the <clears throat> to the floor. Sure, just uh, I'll take the cost and governance um, and keep in mind that we're technical folks. So I'd have to pull the actual team member, you know, if, if you want to get into details, we'll have to pull in the business folks, but it would it would really vary. Um, in, in the case, for example, with Cineverse, you know, Cineverse would would bear the cost of of, of the full environment, but obviously they'll, they'll in, in ter turn be charging uh, the, the, the different carriers. Now, if in, in, in other cases, if it's a conglomerate, if it's a set of uh, different uh, um, CSPs or vendors or whatever that get together, then they will have an agreement amongst themselves on, on those, on how specifically th those costs would be borne. So it really is on a case by case basis. It depends on who is going to manage and, uh, and uh, own that blockchain. So if it's that one single entity, usually they'll bear the cost, but obviously they'll distribute the price to, to others. But if it's a group of companies that have come together, then they will have their own governance policy and uh, process for dealing with it. And, and the governance can can get fairly fairly complicated also. It all, again, it all depends on uh, how much uh, authority the whole group has versus the individual corporation or company that's managing and owning it. Okay. As a, thank you. And uh, the, the other question, uh, I, I, I think um, I don't want to answer this question. I would rather you answer this question. Uh, it basically do is say, what, what is the platform uh, that you're using is one thing. And then uh, what is the <clears throat> technology used that for N-tiered architecture? Uh, when you connect the UI, business logic, and database, uh, and UI business logic. So I, I'm, I think it's kind of an uh, IBM cloud uh, mm -hmm. solutions. Uh, so, but then I, I would like you to answer that. And then also uh, related to the same thing is how are IoT devices connected to this platform? So, so you, know, you have your have cloud services, your IBM, IBM platform, blockchain platform, and then, and then how is IoT uh, figures in this solution? Yeah, so uh, let me try to answer one by one. So first we are using Hyperledger Fabrics, uh, uh, but we are in this, in our solutions, we are actually using block IBM's implementation of Hyperledger Fabric. We have uh, it available on both private and, and uh, IBM uh, public cloud as well. So what uh, we are using in most of our solutions is the, the one uh, hosted on IBM cloud. So Hyperledger Fabric, uh, basically IBM's own implementation of it, uh, running on, uh, I think it initially it, uh, we were using the version running on Kubernetes, but moving forward, we'll be using the one running on OpenShift. Um, and then, uh, but it's all hype, uh, it's uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric and the latest development methods that we're using are more close to SDK. Uh, I about the entire architecture and I'm, I'm reading that question how the UI business logic and database connects to it so basically uh, 
uh, we ex expose the APIs uh, from the Hyperledger fabric using uh, a Cloud Foundry application or, or you can say a Node.js application running on cloud. So basically we create a, a, a server on cloud that exposes the uh, uh, Hyperledger um, uh, APIs, uh, obviously uh, using the encryption uh, uh, methods that comes with Hyperledger. And then we use uh, an integration layer that we create in between to integrate with the other tools uh, like uh, UI, other external external tools like order management that we showed, uh, orchestrators and all that. So all that is, is, is talking to our Hyperledger. They're using an integration uh, a layer in the NN API layer. Um, uh, what was the other question oh, oh, sorry. about the IoT devices? Yes. So for IoT devices as well, we are using IBM's IoT platform. So IoT platform is, is what manages those IoT devices and then talks to the uh, uh, Hyperledger layer via APIs. And yes, we can add IoT devices uh, at, uh, on the fly. We also show that in our demo that how we are adding creating identity of new, new IT devices. So we are using, are using uh, we are using cloud DBs as a database that is being managed by blockchain. So those identities of the new IT devices added to those cloud DBs. So the, the IOT device is totally independent, right? So it doesn't have to do anything to do with it. Yeah, so we, we, yeah exactly. So basically it could be your existing process. For example, let's say, uh, and uh, you already have a process of, of creating and deploying IoT devices. So it, blockchain or Hyperledger layers is just a, a overlay on top of it, that how you are securing that process. Okay, so the, the next question was, you know, um, when, when you start adding these uh, additional players in your network, right? Um, so do they have their own instance of, of Hyperledger or how, how do you, again, I probably kind of yeah. a little bit tied to that governance part, but mm -hmm. more in terms of a generic solution. Uh, right. You know, if I were to do for some kind of a generic solution, what what is the kind of government that you have? How do you get the other players to say, okay, mm -hmm. either you part get part into it in terms of um, the, the solution or the cost or the value, or can you get, get some insight into that? So again, uh, I'll, I'll extend what Matthews explained. So this could be a case by case basis. Again, uh, depends on how who who the main host of that blockchain platform is and how they are offering that service. Right. For example, let's say uh, if it's a consortium, in, in let, let's take example of telecom. Right. If it's a consortium of different CSPs working together and they are working on a, on a business use case that they all benefit from and they all are, are partnering in, in that platform. So in that case, the governance uh, could be uh, centrally or distributed. And then each of the uh, CSP can have their own um, uh, peers connected to the blockchain service. Right? So that way the, the infrastructure and the service can be distributed as well. In, in another case, like the, for example, the case of Cineverse, let's say Cineverse is, is hosting that platform for settlements. So it's a service that they're offering to service providers. So in that case, they can be the host. They can have ad peers to just scale or scale in and scale up uh, their um, uh, platform capabilities, uh, but they can offer that as a service to their other service providers. So they necessarily don't have to create peers or they don't have to add those service providers uh, to that ecosystem, to the blockchain ecosystem. They can just expose APIs to that platform for them to use that service. Thank you. So I, I kind of open up the, uh, <clears throat> I unmuted everybody. So if you want to ask a quick question, I think I, I can see that you are muted on your phone or your computer. So go ahead and unmute and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to. Uh, direct your question to Aman and um, <coughs> Matthias at this time. Hey, <clears throat> hey, this is Badruddin Peter. I'm sorry. Uh, I just have to ask this question in detail. <laughs> so uh, give me, give me a minute here. So uh, the question I have is, uh, like in your architecture, is there any data that you have maintained of the chain? Yes. And uh, and what is the kind of database you have used and uh, what are the limits you have or challenges you have? Yes, uh, we do maintain data off chain because 
uh, and again, again, when, whenever I, I discuss this with, with our other account teams as well and, and client POCs and, and RFPs, we uh, always stress on the fact that blockchain is not a database. So every data is not supposed to go on blockchain, only the transactional data and the key uh, security related data are supposed to go on blockchain. So yes, we, we uh, save data uh, on off chain, but we can map certain keys or manage that database which is uh, an off-chain database in our service with blockchain. For example, in, in, the, in one of the uh, videos that I show currently, we, we were using uh, a service that IBM created. So there's an offering by IBM called Blockchain Data Store. So what that does it is actually, uh, it's basically a, a, like a, 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 a built already ready to use cloud database service that we offer with our blockchain uh, implementations that you can use that to, to store documents, data, data, anything like that. It's a basically an object store. So, so we use okay. that, we, we've been using that. And then in some of our use cases, we also uh, use cloud DB. As an so, so when you're using this off, off chain database, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're designing your whole application, because now you have a UI and business logic that interacts with the off chain mm -hmm. and then uh, it also should start interacting with uh, the blockchain ledger itself uh, whenever it is required, right? right? So the UI and the business logic you design, uh, is, is that still part of the IBM platform or else you can go ahead and design in any other technology if you would like to? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it, it's not part of the, it doesn't have to be and it's not part of the IBM platform. The UI, okay. uh, basically, we, we, that's one of the key things that we demonstrate that this is supposed to integrate even with your legacy systems. So let's say you already have a, a dashboard. So for example, mm -hmm. the one that we show in, in the videos that you saw, that's just a custom UI that we created just to demonstrate an abstract of what, what information will go to different dashboards for different participants, right? But then they, you already might have existing UIs and dashboards and databases that you might want to integrate with. So that's the capability that we have. You don't have okay. to replace all your process. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering my questions. So, uh, Aman, one other question. Uh, I think it's. I think it uh, came from uh, Jyoti. Basically, I, I also kind of agree with her. Like, you know, with, with the, uh, I worked, like I said, you know, 25 years uh, plus with telecom vendors and carriers. What we were, and we were part of the one million homes that we got fiber to the home, and. They, need to, they have a legacy culture there, the telecom world, and they're trying to change. It's a, I mean, AT&T wants to do a lot of different stuff. Verizon moved away from landline. Uh, they're moving there. 5G, 6G is driving this stuff. Uh, but the culture is still there, right? And in, uh, in the telecom legacy, uh, I think it's kind of to, to paraphrase uh, uh, Joseph's question here. How, how do you uh, kind of, try to solve this problem of, you know, uh, the cost sharing and getting the uh, legacy providers and carriers and vendors to be willing to share because, it, I mean, there's, there's, there's some amount of sharing involved in this in terms of your channels and hyperledger or, you know, data sharing or, or governance or something like that. So do you uh, guys, uh, at least in, in the in the in the model that you have is you know TRAI is different. Uh, uh, with India is trying to do a lot of stuff. They're very progressive. They're willing to make some you know uh, changes quickly. But if you look at generally either Europe or or uh, Americas um, or uh, even Latin America in terms of uh, uh, how do you get this 5G 60 people to do? You're talking about. Uh, uh, the network to be shared across multiple um, stakeholders. Yeah, you really need to go present a good business case. You know, I'll, I'll take Cineverse as an example. So what happens is when you make a call right now when you're roaming, AT&T does not know that you've made the call. Let's say you've gone through Europe and you're on the Vodafone network or something. AT&T does not know. That information all goes to a clearinghouse, in this case, Cineverse. And they then do the reconciliation and everything else. And, and that 
you know, trans, the, 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 that sort of transaction can, can take quite a bit of time. So sometimes you may notice, especially in your billing cycle, if, you're, if you've traveled overseas, you may not see an overseas bill for maybe a month or so. So when blockchain first came out, most people thought that we don't need these clearing houses anymore, right? All we need is all the telcos to get together and basically agree that they're going to write the transactions into blockchain and uh, they would then go ahead and um, get, completely get rid of this intermediate party and um, there'd be a whole bunch of cost savings, etc. What Cineverse did was we worked work with IBM, etc. We basically had to go and make a compelling business case as to why they have so many things that the other CSPs don't have and they basically need to now move to the next stage and use blockchain as part of their solution. Now, everything, you know, each use, every legacy uh, resistance that you get will be different, but it's very important with blockchain as with others, especially with blockchain that you start off with a good valid business case. Because if you take the bottom up approach, which is, oh, let's just go try something and then let's try something else and uh, sort of let it, let it go up, up the chain, you may not be successful because you're quickly going to hit this roadblock of, oops, for this to be successful, I have to deal with multiple collaborators. I have to deal with all these relationships. So we would suggest taking a top-down approach, you know, for each use case, try to find out what that compelling business value is and sh show them, look, if they don't move to blockchain, there's a danger that this organization or this division within the company could be obsolete. And uh, these are the alternatives that you have. Or if they do use blockchain, it opens up a whole set of new opportunities. So, for example, with blockchain in um, what, what Cineverse was able to do is with blockchain, okay, not only are you now able to reconcile the bills, you're able to do, offer new services around fraud, you're able to offer new services around a whole set of additional things. And by the way, I'm not saying Cineverse is, is doing this, okay, but that's the compelling value that you are now able to provide that in the past you would have had great difficulty doing. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, uh, I think that's kind of really answered the <clears throat> quite a bit of the question. I think, I, I think there's uh, definitely value. I think it's um, you now uh, what we're talking here is technology, like you guys uh, mentioned, you're technology people, but uh, on the business side, there's a, there's a big value. You know, uh, I have been involved in, in this in the last two years, um, uh, two years before COVID. So I have to say that because of my, I started with the healthcare industry, but my background being telecom, I think there is a, there's a big value, but it's, a, it's the, the way you present it and, uh, and the valid proposition, I think that is there's a huge uh, uh, opportunity, uh, both for the provider carriers and the end users here. Yes, there is. So I think we are kind of in a 10 minutes over. Uh, again, I thank uh, everybody for participating. This is our um, first uh, monthly meeting that we're planning. We were uh, planning to have our um, in in uh, uh, face events, um, but uh, online is fine to start with. Uh, eventually, at some point, we will do uh, face to face meeting. We do have a couple of locations. We plan to have it in uh, different locations in Dallas, um, downtown Dallas, North Dallas, North Dallas, and also uh, around closer to the current county. Um, the next event we will uh, we are planning on for July 14th. Uh, please uh, watch out for uh, July 14th event. Uh, we will have uh, we have an identified speaker, and then we'll have monthly events uh, going forward. And, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me, and I will. I mean, if you uh, need to get more questions, you know, I know uh, <clears throat> Matthew and. Um, uh, um, will will and IBM um, both of them you know um, will will be able to provide uh, as much information as you want uh, in terms of providing the solution. Uh, I feel strongly about hyperlink fabric. Uh, one last question I have, um, both for um, um, Matthew and you know, do you foresee where uh, 
uh, now a lot of people are talking about private Ethereum. Um, there is a, there is a, a pretty much interest because of the existing opportunity, but then uh, I'm talking about a private Ethereum solution. So if you can give me a, like a two minute or one minute answer on private Ethereum versus Apple Fabric. Um, I, to be honest with you, have not. We've been primarily working with Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, Aman, do you have a thought? Any, any thoughts about that, or anybody else? Yeah, our 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 focus has been solely on the Hyperledger uh, part, because it's mainly because IBM supports that, and and all our platforms are based on that. So yeah, we have not explored uh, our our solutions with Ethereum. Oh, thank you. So I mean, like I said, you know, you know, like people say, you know, keep your Friends closer, but enemies closer. <laughs> uh, I, I believe in hyperledger fabric and it's about the private uh, solution, but uh, there's a lot, of, lot more. Uh, we have to be as business people. We need to understand uh, that what 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 your competition is and what it is, and uh, just wanted to kind of see. Uh, this is a question that I ask everybody that uh, on the from the hashgraph or our art recorder or hyperledger fabric to make sure that you know we we, we kind of you know represent different opportunities for everybody and then you know then say you know here's, here's why this is a better better solution and there's an hyperledger fabric and if you look at look, look at the uh I'll just tell thank david that i uh, stole the the greenhouse landscape from hyperledger fabric because there is so much going on there and it is running under the linux foundation the linux foundation uh, under linux foundation the hyperledger fabric is the most fastest growing open source solution and um, to back it up um, thanks to uh, IBM uh, is doing a lot of work uh, to provide the solution I know that Gary is saying and Kumo and others are very active in the solution so uh, thanks again um, Matthew and Aman uh, for the presentation if uh, nobody else has any questions uh, we can we can drive it wrap this up Hey, thanks, Raj, Jyoti, David, really appreciate you giving us the chance to present and for everybody listening. Thank you again, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you Thank you. For thank you. And we now close the Hyperlogy Dallas session. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for the session. Thank you. Thank you.